Amen. Good to see everyone back tonight. We are in Psalm 23. Uh, we started last week and covered three points. We have two more points tonight to cover. And despair to delight is what we're trying to get across. And uh, we did several psalms already. We're not doing every single one, but just chosen ones. Someday maybe we'll do every single one. It's a great study. Psalm 23, I'm, we're going to read it again. Let's do that together. We did it together last time. It's uh, only s- six verses. We'll read out loud together, uh, nice and slow. The 23rd Psalm, a Psalm of David, starting in verse 1. All right, ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And all God's people said, Amen. I uh, love this psalm. Everybody uh, pretty much just sees this as one of the favorite chapters in the Bible, and it's used a lot. Of course, I use it a lot at memorial services and funerals when we talk about uh, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But we've already said last week that there were some great promises in this psalm. We looked at the first three. The Lord will provide for me. The Lord is my shepherd. Remember, I shall not want Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will bring me peace, making me to lie down in green pastures. He will pacify me, we said. And then the Lord will preserve me. That's what we looked at last week. But two more uh, promises, beginning with uh, the third verse. The Lord will pilot me. He will pilot me. You ever see people on their cars have a bumper sticker? The Lord is my, God is my co-pilot. Well, hopefully he's the pilot and we're the co-pilot, right? He's going to pilot me. Psalm 23, 3 says, and we read already, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Of course, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, not English, and the word leadeth there means to run with a sparkle. Uh, believe it or not, I used to be very fast. You know, They used to call me Twinkle Toes Kuzo. Uh, that's not true. I was faster than I am now. <laughs> Terry could chase me now and catch me. The word leadeth here, and I can chase her and can't catch her, but the word leadeth here means run with a sparkle, to flow, to conduct, to protect, to sustain, to carry, to feed, to lead, (laughs) to guide. And so the Lord is my pilot. He will lead. He will guide. And uh, it's, it's like being on an airplane, and we put our lives, you know, when you get on a plane, you don't know the pilot. You never met the pilot. You might say on the way out, nice flight, and get off the plane. But you're trusting. You're putting your life in the hands of a stranger. Well, we can trust that God, again, uh, is a great pilot, better than any man. The pilot in the plane takes us from point A to point B, right? Well, the Lord wants to be our leader, our pilot, our guide. It says he pilots us, he leads us for his namesake. It's actually for the sake of his reputation. (laughs) You know, uh, one cause of despair in our lives are bad decisions. We make poor choices, and life is a a series of decisions over and over again. Bad decisions following the wrong path, not the righteous path, will lead to despair, uh, problems, sin, destruction, death. But the path of righteousness, making good decisions, leads to delight. So God is not going to lead us in bad decisions. We always uh, think, you know, and and know that when we make decisions, we want to pray about things, we want to see what the Bible has to say about things, we ask godly people to give us advice on things. We don't rush into anything. We want to be discerning and make good decisions. Well, the Lord says, and David, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, says, he leads me. He He guides me. It's kind of like the thing where you smell something cooking and the odors are taking you by the nose and pulling you and leading. Now, God doesn't force us, pull us around by the nose, but he's leading us. 
Usually a good leader doesn't get behind and push people, right? He gets out in front and says, follow me. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. He's leading. He's guiding. Well, he leads us in the paths of righteousness. If we followed what he said, we would always make good decisions most of the time. I know we're not perfect, but he leads us. He leads us. But do we allow him? <laughs> you could always lead and some people, but they, not, they may never follow you. There's uh, sometimes problems with people following a leader. We can make bad decisions. I've made many bad ones. I'm sure you could get up and say the same thing. And it leads to discouragement, unhappiness, depression, whatever. We think of making moves in life. Should I stay here? Should I move? Uh, a, a decision on a, of an employment. I know some of you have changed positions. We have children that are working in jobs and they maybe don't like this job, move to another one. They're praying and they're asking us to guide them into making good decisions. Very important things. In every area of life, the Lord wants to guide. He wants to pilot us in the paths of righteousness. If, if we're going to do that, there's three things we have to do in order to allow the Lord to pilot us. Three quick things. Number one, we ask God for guidance. This means let go of pride, let go of ego and self, and ask for God's direction. Remember James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And upbraideth not means he's not going to be upset that we go and ask him. And it shall be given him, it says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man, who? The man that's asking not in faith. Let him not think he'll receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So when we ask God for guidance, we ask in faith. The word ego, you can look at as, as an acrostic. E-G-O means edging God out. A lot of us don't ask God for guidance because we think we don't need him. Uh, we have wisdom. We have our own uh, learning that we've gone through life and, and uh, decisions that we make because we feel, hey, I've seen so many things in my life. I've lived long enough. You know, Israel would always get in trouble when they went ahead and did something without checking with God and praying and asking him. Notice that in the Bible over and over again. God says, all right, you want to do it without me? Go ahead and see how you do. Of course, they did very bad without God's blessing. And so we want to ask God. We want to let go of our egos and, and ask God for wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to make right decisions, <laughs> but not asking half-heartedly. You know, in Matthew chapter, chapter 9, verse 28 and 29, Jesus was healing these two blind men. And it says, when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, believe ye that I am able to do this, to heal you. They said to him, yea, Lord. It says, then touched he their eyes. He said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Nothing limits God's ability to lead us in the paths of righteousness except a lack of faith. Not faith in ourselves, all right? Faith that he can do what we need him to do for guidance, to lead us in the paths of righteousness. We must ask. We must have faith knowing that he, and again, he's not going to lead us in the wrong way. We will go the wrong way a lot of times if we do it without him. So ask in faith. Secondly, wait. This is a tough one for me. Wait on the Lord. Sometimes we ask God for wisdom, and then we go out and do it on our own anyway. For 120 years, they waited. Noah waited for rain. They didn't even know what rain was, because then they had a water blanket around the earth. It was dew on the ground. I mean, they didn't. It's going to rain. What's that? Repent. It's going to rain. There's going to be a flood. Everyone's going to die. They didn't believe him, because they didn't even know what rain was. 120 years. How many people did he change on, the, on their minds to believe him and get on the ark. Nobody. We would say he's a failure, but he wasn't a failure. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Noah. Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Everyone else had said they all they could think about all the time was evil continually. God said it repented that he had made man and he was going to destroy all humans off the face of the earth. But Noah, thank God for Noah, found grace he was a faithful man, maybe the only one in the world at that time. God used him to repopulate the earth. We are descendants of Adam, but we're also all descendants of Noah. Amen? He waited 120 years, but it happened. He did exactly what God told him to do. Built that ark, and God 
close the door, the Bible says. Moses waited 40 years, remember? He, he murdered someone, and he delayed and had to wait 40 years in Midian. David waited 20 years, running away from Saul and his javelin to become the king. The nation of Israel waited 4,000 years for the Messiah. When he came, a lot of them didn't trust him. The Bible has story after story of people that waited on God because faith waits. Faith waits. Psalm 5, 3 says, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up, that looking up, waiting patiently for the answer from God. It's uh, not an easy thing. We have everything today, and, and the, this generation is instant. And, uh, when Terry comes home from school, sometimes I'm not ready for dinner yet, but I'm like a little hungry for a snack. So I go get the popcorn, you know, and put it in the microwave. Years ago, we had to get a pan, put oil, put the corn in there, put the cover on, and wait and wait until you hit. And then you'd burn a few, and it was a mess. You had to clean the pan. Now you throw the thing in the microwave, beep. I don't even have to put the timer on. The machine knows automatically, three and a half minutes, I think it is, the popcorn's perfect, put it in a bowl and eat it. We have instant everything. The Keurig, you know, the K-Cups, want a nice pot of coffee years ago, we had to get an old-fashioned pot, put water in there, put the little stem in the middle, put a few scoops of coffee, cover it up, put it on the flame, and we're waiting. And all of a sudden, after a few minutes, you'll see, bloop, bloop, bloop. Oh, well, that was the best coffee, by the way. And it's percolating, and it's going. My mother always had a pot of coffee going. But you had to wait. Now you just go. <laughs> you drink a nice cup of hot coffee. It's not that way with faith. There's no uh, microwave faith or K-cup faith. Psalm 37, 7 through 9 says, Rest in the Lord and wait you know, a person that has, is impatient, they're not resting. If you have a big thing coming up, big event, when we were getting married uh, seven months ago, the night before the wedding, you think, think Terry and I slept good? I think she was snoring. Probably she was, but I didn't sleep. I still don't sleep good. I haven't slept good in about 10 years, but the thing is, because a lot of times your mind is going and you're thinking of things and you can't just lay down and just relax. You know, the problem is, if the Lord's in control, you can. I say, well, what does that mean, Pastor? God's not, oh, he's in control. I have to give it over to him all the way. It says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. I got it from my dad, I think. You know, he used to, in New Jersey, you cannot pump your own gas. Over here, I go to Costco, I get out, pump my own gas and take off. Over there, you sit in the car and you wait. My dad, worse than me, we sat there, he'd be going, he just pulled in, and he's already going like this. Five seconds goes by. The guy didn't come out of the station. He put it in drive, and he'd take off. He said, I'll go to the next station. Very impatient. Hope I'm not like that. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices. See, the, it, they were looking at people that were prospering, that were evil and doing bad, and they were getting impatient. He says, wait, rest in me. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself to do evil, for evildoers will be cut off. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. He's trying to tell them why you should wait, why you should rest. Wait patiently, I'm going to guide you, but you have to wait sometimes. You know Isaiah 40, 31, we sing it. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We used to sing at the end, teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to, to wait. To allow him to lead us in the paths of righteousness. We ask in faith, we wait on the Lord. But there's one other thing, third, listen. We listen to the Lord. Now, uh, you have a favorite radio station? <laughs> I, I don't listen to, uh, I listen to nice music, I listen to Christian music, I listen to classical music, and I listen to oldies. i got to confess my sin tonight. Do we have a priest here? <laughs> uh, I, I just don't like the new songs. If I'm going to listen to any music in the world, I try usually listen to stuff that in the 50s and 60s, right? And so there's a station here from Y and I. Oldies 101. Pow, pow, pow. <laughs> so Terry and I will be driving in the car, and I just hit the button. And we'll listen to some of those songs. Now, would I ever think about playing that in church? Never. But 
I, it's just I'd rather listen to that than some kind of. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, but uh, we went soul winning once with a, an evangelist that when I first got saved, he was teaching me, this is what you do, these are the best verses you memorize. We went cold turkey, door to door, and in uh, Jupiter, Florida. And we walked in, and the kid comes to the door, and it smelled like he was smoking pot in there, you know, one of these uh, just young, long-haired kind of a guy. And the evangelist tells him, hey, I'm right here with... Uh, Dr. Cuso, I was a chiropractor then in Florida, went out with him for about four hours to go soul winning. He was going to train me, you know. And uh, he says, all right, come on in. The guy says, you want to come in? Sure, we want to come in. We're sitting on the couch, and he's witnessing to the guy, and the music he had on the radio was blasting, that you couldn't hear yourself talk. And he's trying to talk to the guy and witness to him. He said, listen, buddy, this is the event. It's not me. I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm the silent partner learning from him. He says, put my favorite radio station on. The guy goes, oh, yeah, he went over to me. What, what is it? He goes, W-O-F-F, shut that thing off. <laughs> oh, the guy, the, everything this guy did, I would not advise you to do as a soul winner. And he's talking about hell. And he's telling the guy, hell is hot, and it's burning, and it's torment, and it's forever. And he took a book of matches that the guy had on the table. And, and he stuck it right in the guy's face. And the guy goes, hey, hey, I get the point. He said, that's what hell is like. I'm saying to myself, no way this guy is going to get saved. That guy got saved. He prayed this in his prayer, and I'm sitting there like, I can't believe it. The thing is, wait on the Lord. Listen. We have favorite radio stations. Guess what? We have to tune in. Do you know there's radio waves right out here, right now in the air, that if you have that receiver, you tune into that station, and you get certain stations. We have to tune in and listen to the Lord. Job 33, 14 says, God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. God speaking, <laughs> we have his word, we have the Holy Spirit, but sometimes we don't listen. We're not tuned in. How do you get tuned in? His word, amen? He'll lead us in the paths of righteousness, help us make right decisions, if we're listening, Jesus said in John chapter 10, chapter about my sheep, hear my voice. <laughs> as sheep, as Christians, we're like sheep, we're compared to sheep in the Bible. Jesus, the great shepherd, says, my sheep, you're saved, you're my children. I'm the great shepherd. You need to listen to me. He said, they hear my voice and they follow him. Where's the best place to hear his voice in his word by his spirit? In church, amen, in the local New Testament church. The Lord will pilot me, we said. He'll lead me. But we have to ask. We have to pray. We have to ask him to show us. We have to wait, and we have to listen. And then the last point for tonight is the Lord will protect me. Protect me. Look at verse 4, Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. And then he mentions two things there. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, David saying, I fear no evil. Even when the Lord is our shepherd, you know, <laughs> life is not always going to be green pastures and still waters. We're going to have trials in our lives, right? Sometimes we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I don't believe it's only talking about death here. I believe it's talking about maybe terrible trials in our life. You know, life is a mixture of pleasure and pain, <laughs> problems and blessings, mountaintops and valleys. And when you walk through the dark valley sometimes in life, we have to remember a few things. Number one, valleys are perpetual. <laughs> They're going to have them through life. Somebody said you're either in a, in a trial, you've just came out of one, or you're about to go into one, right? David says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Again, maybe suffering, maybe strife, maybe trials. But the valleys shouldn't surprise us. We should expect it. Job chapter 5, verse 7. Job went through trials, amen? He said, yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. <laughs> They're part of life. Job also wrote this. Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. Life is short, but the problems are there throughout life. It's a test. These trials, sometimes we bring them on ourselves because of things we did wrong, but sometimes God sends them. Job was being tested. Abraham was being tested when God promised him a son, and he got the son eventually and said, now I want you to take him up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. He was testing him. 
So valleys are perpetual. We're going to have them. We don't know when they're going to come, but they're going to come. Mark it down. Second, they have a purpose. There's a divine purpose behind every dark valley that God allows us to walk through. James in James chapter 1 verse 2 tells us to do this when you come to diverse temptations or trials. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The word refers to adversity or trials, temptations there. Somebody said trials are like ice cream. They come in different flavors. There's financial trials. There's emotional trials. There's relationship trials. There's bereavement trials. There are career trials. <laughs> but one thing about trials is you're not going to get bored with it because they're, they're different flavors and different times and different ways in your life. But he says, count it all joy. James 1.3 says, knowing this, the trying of your faith works patience. Somebody told me don't pray for patience. I said, I'm praying for patience as a doctor with a T in it, not with a C in it. But if you pray for patience, he said, God's going to send you trials so that you can develop patience. So don't pray for that. You know what? Whether you pray or not, God wants to develop this character in you. You're going to get them. Verse 4 of James says, let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, mature, wanting nothing. So the trial has a purpose. When we look back at our trials as Christians, we see it helped us. We can say maybe in the trial we didn't see that. When you come out the other side of the trial, you... You thank the Lord for it, and, and it, it helped you to grow. Valleys have a divine purpose to develop our faith and our character. All right? So they're perpetual. They have a purpose. They can be. They may be permanent. Sometimes things come our way, and they don't go away. Sometimes the healing that people get is going to heaven. That's the ultimate healing. Amen? So whatever the problem is, uh, Paul had a perpetual no he had a permanent problem what was that we don't know for sure it was a thorn in the flesh remember he prayed three times thrice he said to god please take the thorn away second corinthians chapter 12 uh, a lot of people believe it was his eyesight because he was blinded on the road to damascus he said he wrote large letters and his letters his words is we, we don't know but, but but a lot of theologians seem to think that's what it was and he, he couldn't see good maybe it was but it was a thorn Instead of taking the thorn after he prayed, what did God say to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9? My grace is sufficient for thee, Paul. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. In his weakness, Paul was one of the greatest Christians in all of history, in all of Christendom. What he did with his poor eyesight, with his thorn in the flesh, maybe he did it better because he realized his weakness and depended on the Lord more. And the Lord can do more to a weak vessel. God chooses, remember, the weak things to confound right, the wise and the, and the strong. Paul, keep the thorns, God said. And I'll give you the grace. What did Paul say? More gladly. <laughs> he agreed. I'll, I'll rejoice in my iniquities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I don't think sometimes we, I, I know, again, I'm guilty maybe of the same thing. When trials come. Take it away. <laughs> Why? It's helping you. We don't see it that way all the time. Four kinds of grace are mentioned in the Bible. Saving grace, empowering grace, sustaining grace. That's what we need in the valleys that don't go away. And refining grace. But Paul got God's sustaining grace to help him with the thorn in the flesh. So, the, you know, these people that say, well, you know, you don't have enough faith. God's going to make you rich and you're going to be healthy. You know, the health and wealth gospel. Well, I guess Paul didn't know about that one. I'd rather have God's uh, grace and any problem than not to have his grace and have no problems. When problems arise, we pray, we wait, we listen. God's going to remove it or he's going to give us the grace to live with it, maybe for our whole life. The dark valleys of life, David says here in Psalm 23, remember this, the Lord is your shepherd and we can say, as he said here, I will fear no evil. Now that word will means it's a choice he made. I will not fear evil. Why? You're with me. God's presence. God's presence. In the dark valley, we can choose fear or faith. I'll fear no evil or no, I'm going to fear. It's a choice. If we choose faith, we must remember what God said in Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not. 
God told the prophet to write down. For I am with thee, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. The entire verse says, I will strengthen thee, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The right hand is the strong hand. David would fear no evil because he said he chose it. He was going to choose faith rather than fear. David wrote this in the fourth verse. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Now the rod was a, a, like a club, like a baseball bat, used to protect the sheep from predators. Come on, wolf. The rod, protection, like a club. The staff was a slender pole with a hook or a crook on one end. And sometimes when the sheep would fall down into a crevice or a ditch, the shepherd would reach down with his staff, hook them around and, and pull them out. His staff would go sometimes against the side of the sheep if they were going off course to nudge them to get back away from danger. The shepherd used the rod for protection and the staff to guide the sheep. The staff represents guidance from the Lord. David said, God, your rod, sometimes of correction, and your staff of guidance, I have that as well as your presence to comfort me. Do you ever feel that? Sometimes I feel the nudge. I don't know about you, when you're going to get up and teach or preach or do a devotion. Or the, the nudge of his guiding staff before I get up to preach. I know I have the message here. I have it all written down, but there's many, many a time, like tonight and this morning, where I will feel his nudge to lead me in, in another direction and to lead me to, to, to say what the Scripture means and, and bring something to my memory that I was studying all week. Pastor Sexton used to say, he doesn't preach with notes. He doesn't have any notes at all. I, I have not gotten the courage to do that yet. And he says, here's what you do when you study. You dig a deep well. You just add to the well. You study and you add and you read. And when you preach, you pull out from that well that you studied on all week. Well, he has a deeper well than me, I guess. But the, the, the nudge, sometimes you, you feel the nudge of his staff leading you when you read his word. He may lead you to a word or a verse that he wants you to focus on and concentrate on that you might need this week. Sometimes you feel the tapping of the Lord's nudge when another Christian says something to you that is going to help you and maybe even correct you. And you say, oh, I, I needed that. It was a nudge from the Lord that he uses people. In the valleys of life, and we're going to have them, God wants us to find comfort in his protecting rod and his guiding staff. Understanding the rod and staff here helps us appreciate what David wrote in Psalm 34, 19. David said this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Boy, preach that out in the world. See how many people say they don't want to come to church and get saved, right? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Trust Christ today. <laughs> but here's the good news. The Lord delivereth him out of them all. All, not some, all. There's a big difference in the life of a Christian and a non-Christian, all right? Not just sinning and things, but we both get disappointed. It rains on, the, uh, on everyone, right? The sun shines on everybody. Both get sick. Both experience trials and tragedies, lose loved ones, have relationship problems, face financial difficulties, have work issues. The difference is not the absence of dark valleys. Saved and lost have both. The difference here is the presence of the shepherd, amen? The presence of the shepherd in our lives. He says, I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. And it doesn't stop there. For thou art with me. He's with you. He's with us. What a difference that makes when we go through these things. Amen. The Lord will pilot, we said, or lead you and I, but we have to ask. Ask not. We have not, James says, because we ask not. Then he says, wait. Wait upon the Lord. And then listen. Are we listening? He wants to guide us in the paths of righteousness. We need wisdom. If we lack wisdom, let, let him ask of God. We'll give it out liberally. That's the only good liberal I know when God gives us liberally. Amen? <laughs> he will protect me. But I must remember, valleys are going to come, and they have a purpose. And they can be permanent. But God's grace will be sufficient. Amen? Do you ever go through anything like that? And it seems like uh, it's just some trials I've been through, 
have lasted hours, they've lasted days, they've lasted weeks. But this one has lasted years. <laughs> Maybe it's a health issue, I don't know. Maybe it's someone else in your life that has a health issue that you're taking care of, I don't know. Maybe it's someone you love that's not here anymore and you, you depended on them and now you must depend on God. Not a bad thing, by the way, to depend on God. What are you going through? And, and through it all, God has a purpose. And the psalmist, the David was a shepherd, so he knew about shepherding, amen? And so he's writing this from a person who has the heart of a shepherd. You know, as leaders and elders in the church, I'm reading a book that Brother Kenny gave me about eldership. We have to have a heart to lead, to teach, and to love. The Bible says the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Well, I don't know if I'm going to stand in front of a, of a car, maybe. Or take a bullet for Brother Kenny, I don't know. <laughs> but the thing is, I must be willing to do that. Would you be willing? Would you say, I love this brother and sister so much that I'd be willing to die for them? Jesus said <laughs> he was a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He said, while we were yet sinners, we're saying about people we love, Will we die for them? Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8. That's a real love, amen? Do we love like that? I don't know. I would like to say I do, but I don't think so. I don't think uh, as humans we can have that love we're supposed to. This is how we know you're Christians, by your love. Love for the brethren, yes. Love for the lost, yes. God says... He wants to be our shepherd. He says he's going to take care of us. Jehovah Jireh, we saw that already. He's going to lead us in the paths of righteousness if we will allow him to lead us and be humble, all right, and, and flexible, pliable in his hands. And then when you go through the valleys of life, the trials, even to the point of death, thou art with me. I know a lot of folks that uh, we knew uh, that have died, some of them saved in heaven now, some not, and it's sad, but, you know, the, the Christians that died, they say Christians know how to die well, and I used to say, what does that mean? That means they're not afraid of death. <laughs> death has, there's no fear. It's lost its sting, it says in the Bible. Why? Because we have the victory in Christ. We're, we're not going just to the grave or to hell. We're going to be in heaven forever with him. That's victory, amen? And we have no fear. I know a lot of people, they say, uh, that are dying, they wait until their loved ones leave the room. They want to be alone. But if you're a Christian, you're not alone. He's with you in the valley of the shadow of even death itself. And he takes us by the hand and brings us to the other side. Amen? And so am I looking forward to dying? No. I want to live and serve the Lord as long as he has me to live. But when it comes to that point, I'll know that he's with us. He's with me. He's with you all the way through. Amen? Let's trust in the God who's with us in the valleys, and they're going to come, but yet also the mountaintops of life. We have, I praise the Lord, we'll have both. We may have more valleys than mountaintops. Some of us are, are blessed and have maybe more mountaintops than valley experiences, but either way, we're going to have them. Let's deal with them properly, amen, and uh, let the Lord guide us and lead us in the paths of righteousness. I think we have a little bit more to finish those last two verses, uh, probably next week. It's a short psalm, but there's a lot in there, a lot of meat in there, amen? There's a lot of things we, we could have even said more, even about the sheep and the shepherd, but we'll do that again next week. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, love you tonight. Thank you that you are the chief shepherd. Uh, we, uh, Lord, are commanded even that uh, as those of us that are called to be elders and pastors and leaders in the church to be shepherds as well. Under shepherds, of course, not the chief shepherd, but Lord, we thank you that it's a privilege, it's a high privilege and a high honor to be called into service for thee. And help us, Lord, to lead people in the right paths as you would, through your word, by your spirit, Lord, and through circumstances in life, to even in the trials of life, help us to, as James said, count it all joy. Well, we can because you're there with us. You're going to help us. Your rod and your staff are going to comf comfort us as you did other saints throughout the past 6,000 years of human history. And so, Lord, we're thankful that you care about us. You don't rejoice in trials, Lord, but you allow it to happen. And help it to turn out for good. Help it to make us better, not bitter, towards you. Bless the rest of the night tonight, Lord. It's a beautiful evening that as we go to our homes, keep us safe as we begin tomorrow, the work week. Help us have a great week, uh, Lord, glorifying you. 
talking to people about Christ. Lord, make divine appointments for us this week, please, that we be able to talk about you and give the gospel. Uh, Lord, bless uh, the rest of the evening, the fellowship here, and, and as we go to our homes, keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, folks, God bless you. Dismissed.